Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, okay. One second, I need to click on the button that says I got it as far as the, there we go. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so, as uh, Jeanne said, I'm uh, Dave Morrison from Brookhaven, and I'm going to be one moment. I'm just going to move a window out of my way so I can see what I'm doing here. Uh, there we go. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a bit about the future RIC plans, and we'll just you know subtitle this, you know, a look into my post beam energy scan phase two crystal ball. And and right off the bat, I have to make a couple of disclaimers. Um, I don't speak for the DOE Office of Nuclear Physics. That would be Tim Hallman's job. I'm not even the Brookhaven Nuclear and Particle Physics Associate Lab Director. We have a new ALD, that's Haiyan Gao. And, and these are people that make these kinds of decisions. So I, what can I do here? Well, I was a little bit uh, trying to figure out what I can contribute to this. And I think what I can do that might be helpful here is to describe the context in which these post BES, beam energy scan to plans, both for S Phoenix and STAR have been developed. I can tell you about the plans that were shown uh, as part of that to the Brookhaven Nuclear and Particle Physics Program Advisory Committee. That's a, a committee that advises the ALD on how upcoming RIC runs ought to go. And I can, I think, tell you about the response of the PAC, the Program Advisory Committee, to those plans. And, I, and I, along the way, I think I'll do my best to show you some very nice things that uh, will tell you about the physics that will get done and progress uh, on making preparations to do that. So the first part of the context is something that you've probably heard many times before, and that comes from the 2015 NSAC nuclear physics long range plan. And that's the document that is developed every several years, kind of an irregular schedule that decides, it looks into the you know, coming decade, decade and a half or longer to decide and advise NSF and DOE about nuclear physics plans. And in the 2015 plan, there's a page which you can't read and there's a paragraph which you might be able to read that says, ah, what should Rick do? Well. Uh, We'll start with number two in that, that is map the phase diagram of QCD with experiments at RIC, that's the beam energy scan. But step one is probe the inner workings of the quark gluon plasma on different length scales, and that is S Phoenix. So that's a kind of the big broad uh, purpose of the remaining years of the RIC science uh, mission. But Another part of the context uh, is the EIC, the Electron Ion Collider, and it is a big wave that is coming and everything else in comparison is, well, is, is influenced by that big wave which is coming. And if you look at it, not metaphorically, but in a Gantt chart, it looks like this. And what you're seeing is a calendar, it's time across the top axis there from left to right. And the wave is manifest in these yellow bars, which as you go down and to the right, move from things which are on paper and ideas down through building things, installing them, and then running them. And the key thing is up at the top where I've labeled it exclusive access to RIC. The current plan for the EIC is predicated on the idea that starting at the end of calendar year 2025, the EIC project has can go into the RIC tunnel, take things apart, move things around, and in essence, the RIC program for heavy ion physics for hadron hadron collisions stops at that point. So that's the other part of the, the context. We have a purpose, and then on in our future light cone has a certain barrier to it that uh, we need to deal with. So that gives us a run plan, which here you see I've taken from Haiyan Gao's talk at the AGS, Rick and AGS users meeting. And this run plan, um, not too terribly detailed here, over the coming years looks like this. Finish up the beam energy scan using STAR. That's, that's happened. Then in 2022, there is a run with STAR that's focused on forward spin physics. That's a PP collisions, at, it's actually at 510 GeV. And then after that, there is 2023, 24, and 25. 
And that's really driven by the S Phoenix science program. That's full energy collisions of gold, gold, PP and P gold. And I'll talk about both of these in a little more detail here. I will say that the run plan uh, following the beam energy scan, it really hasn't changed much since it was first articulated in 2016 little things, but these always happen. There was a shift later by one year that was due to uh, US federal budgets. Uh, the plan for the star forward run in 22 came as a result of that. So there was an interest in having some running that didn't exist in the original plan in 2016. But these are kind of normal little mutations to even the best laid plans. And so it looks very similar and has looked similar for some years. Okay, so let me, let me tell you a little bit more about the BNL Nuclear and Particle Physics Program Advisory Committee. Now this just met, right? This is the end of June. So, you know, just a tiny bit over a month ago. These meetings happen every year. And what you typically have is a presentation, well, presentation about beam use requests from the operating experiments. So until recently, that meant STAR and Phoenix uh, but now Phoenix stopped taking data at the end of 2016. So the last the year or two after that, it was really STAR presenting their beam use request for the coming year. But now the last couple of years, S Phoenix has been asked to describe what are its plans. And the little box on the right over here was the guidance that we got. Look, these beam use requests should be based on the following number of cryo weeks. Now cryo weeks, that's how many weeks that the Rick machine is cold. Cold means running the helium refrigeration plant. That's where the money goes. It costs, I think, ballpark half a million or maybe three quarters of a million dollars per week to keep Rick cold. And so the number of cryo weeks is really closely tied to the budget. So you get budget guidance, you translate that into cryo weeks. Cryo weeks is not exactly the same thing as physics weeks because you have to spend some time getting the machine cold. You have to spend some time getting the beams going. You have to spend some time warming things up, but okay, they're related, but they're not exactly the same thing. And obviously physics weeks are fewer in number than cryo weeks. So STAR uh, presented a plan and this is the STAR detector. I'm sure everybody's very familiar with it shown in cutout. And what they are planning for the coming year is based on a bunch of upgrades they've done. They've added forward silicon tracking, forward thin strip uh, chambers, they've added hydronic calorimetry, and they have adopted and repurposed what used to be the Phoenix EM Cal. And that's to give them uh, instrumentation and capabilities in the forward direction, which is suitable for spin physics questions. And that's really what they're driving at in run 22 next year. So uh, the observables that they'll be able to measure with all of this new tracking and calorimetry include inclusive jets, die jets. They'll be able to pick apart jets to look for uh, hadrons in jets. They'll have good uh, measurements of lambdas. And they'll be able to correlate all of these observables, both in the forward direction, as well as with uh, measurements that they're still able to make with the, uh, the, the central rapidity TPC, which in recent years has been upgraded with additional uh, tracking layers. So that's the star request for run 22. I think that the, the pack uh, saw that very positively. So let's move on to the years after that and see what the pack says regarding 2023 and 2025. So here are a few uh, choice quotations from the pack report, which was finalized last week. <clears throat> And because you can imagine that most of this is focused on what it mean for S Phoenix. And so as one of the co-spokespersons of S Phoenix, I like reading these things uh, out loud to myself, to my kids uh, as bedtime stories. So S Phoenix construction, installation and operation to accomplish its science goal is now the overarching priority for Rick for the next four or five years. So really hammering home the idea that the main purpose of RIC in the years after, uh, in, in years 23 and 24 and 25 is S Phoenix. <clears throat> uh, the PAC recognizes that the completion of the PP and gold gold runs in 24 and 25 respectively as proposed by S Phoenix are essential to accomplish the overall scientific goals of RIC. 
as detailed in the long range plan. And then, and I didn't add these italics, these are part of what's in the PAC report. The top overall priority in planning for these three runs is to commission the S Phoenix det detector and to achieve its scientific program. The investment that has been made means that these three years should be seen and managed as the first three years of a major, brand new, high impact experimental effort, even though at the same time, they are the last three years of the RIC program. So very positive uh, words from the PAC about uh, S Phoenix plans. And really, as I said, hammering home the idea that the S Phoenix plans are the RIC plans in 23-4. So just, again, things you've seen, I'm sure, in many talks, either given by me or by Gunter, what is the S Phoenix uh, physics program? Of course, it's very nicely aligned with uh, Jetscape. It is a high statistics, highly differential, scale-dependent study of the quark gluon plasma through a few key channels, through key avenues. One that I'm sure everybody in this school is uh, very, very interested in are jets. So jets, jet correlations, jet substructure, and there's a whole uh, uh, growing uh, uh, working group in S Phoenix that is you know, tying together uh, all kinds of uh, observables in using jets, and learning and em employing things that are done at the LHC and with STAR, and seeing how that we'll be able to do that with even higher statistics uh, at RIC at least with S Phoenix. But we'll have the ability to tag a lot of the events with uh, things that are related to uh, the mass of the probe. So either using photons or heavy flavor as a tag. So you can do open heavy flavor, closed heavy flavor, flavor, heavy flavor tag jets. We'll have uh, good abilities to, well, excellent abilities to uh, distinguish the different members of the Upsilon family, 1S, 2S, and 3S. Of course, whether we see the 3S won't depend on our mass resolution, but in heavy ion collisions, whether it's suppressed so much that it's still visible. And then we have uh, capabilities even in cold QCD uh, with the barrel of S Phoenix. Now S Phoenix, I think everybody's familiar with what it looks like. Again, it's a superconducting solenoid surrounded by calorimetry and stuffed full of tracking. Uh, the red cylinders at either end are our minimum bias detectors. Somehow have never bothered to put those in a very nice engineering form for these diagrams. And one thing that we have learned recently will be an addition, which is kind of a nice thing that people in Jetscape should know about. The NSF will be funding uh, an event plane detector, essentially a copy of the very successful event plane detector that has been installed in STAR for the last few years. And that will mean that we can really do a lot of uh, a lot of angular decomposition or doing things as a function of event plane orientation for all of the observables that we had been planning to do before. We had some capabilities using our minimum bias detector, but the event plane resolution is much, much better with the new detector. So now I'm going to show you some, you know, I, I can't help it. I'm going to show you some baby pictures. Um, We've moved very much along from you know, PowerPoint depictions of things to real stuff. So I'll, I'll be quick here. This is in uh, building 1008, that is IR8, that is the assembly hall out on the Rick Ring and the blue uh, uh, cylind hemi-cylindrical uh, contraptions are a part of the carriage that will support the whole experiment. That's me on the left, that's Ed O'Brien, the project director on the right. And we are standing on either side of two sectors of the outer HCAL, that's two down, 30 to go. It gets really interesting after about a dozen of those get installed because then the superconducting solenoid gets placed on top and then the remaining HCAL sectors, each of which weighs 13 or 14 tons, gets installed in place above the superconducting solenoid to make a complete cylinder. And that's happening this summer. Next slide here. Okay, and I mentioned that uh, there'll be 30 sectors to go. Well, they're all built, and here are a bunch of people in the collaboration testing some of those uh, HCAL sectors. They're all completely constructed and ready to go. The tracking, uh, the biggest part of the tracking is the TPC that's being built over at Stony Brook. Here you see the outer field cage. The dimensions I've shown on the right, its diameter is 1.6 meters, substantially more compact than the star TPC and about 1 30th of the volume of the Alice TPC. So very, very compact device. 
compact enough that the support structure at the end, which is shown here, it's called a wagon wheel, and you see some of the gem readout detectors installed on it. It's milled from a single piece of aluminum, which is nice because that means there are very few cracks, much easier to keep a gas tight. Here you see some Stony Brook students installing electronics and cooling into that wagon wheel and getting it prepared for uh, assembly. Uh, we have silicon vertexing at the core of the experiment. And here are staves. The staves are hidden away in the aluminum boxes on the left. What you see coming out on the right are signal and power cables. There are, I think, 84 staves being, or that are gonna be, that are already built. And that's the full complement that we need. They've been built at CERN. They're gonna be transported uh, to um, Los Alamos and LBNL and then to uh, BNL to be installed. And if you've never seen one of these vertexing detectors up close, it is stunning how small they are. Here is the carbon fiber structure that's going to support the three layers. You can see some uh, pincher, pincer clamps in the back there. It's really a very tiny device. There's an aluminum structure at one end of it to hold all the staves in place. And you can see that sitting on someone's hand. It's remarkably tiny, extremely precise. And uh, this is all uh, being assembled now. So the run plan, uh, I mentioned it a little bit. So in 23, the big thing is to commission the detector. This is the first new collider detector at RIC in over 20 years. There's a lot to do. And then we will take some initial gold, gold data. 24. That's our big uh, reference data run. The reference data depends on level one triggers. And so you have to commission that and get a lot of data. And 25 is our monstrous high statistics gold gold data run. And each run has a distinct and important role for the overall science mission. And there you can see the calendar at the bottom. And just re-emphasizing the point that we start to overlap with EIC activities and that's gonna be a complicated choreography. We have an interesting readout system, which is, I think, there's a point to this. Uh, a lot of the system is triggered in a sense if you're, if, that you'd be familiar with experimentally, but the tracking systems operate in, with a streaming readout, which means they just continuously pump out data. And the overall system can take data at 15 kilohertz while remaining 90% live. So even as we're inhaling tons of data, more than about 200 petabytes a year, which compared to what Phoenix and Star do in a typical year, it's about a factor of 20 more data. Uh, we're still live enough that if there are any rare events, we'll be able to trigger on them and take them. So that's for instance, very high PT direct photons or high PT um, jets, uh, we'll be able to fill out uh, with triggers and make sure that we get those. Now, the reason the streaming readout is interesting, uh, let's see, do I have it one second here while I, yeah, uh, let me skip ahead. I, no, sorry, I won't skip ahead. Let me talk about what the jets and photons uh, are, uh, capabilities will be. You can see the PT range will be able to uh, populate in the upper left, really extends out to a PT range that overlaps nicely with what is done at the LHC. So we'll be able to look at some of the same observables in overlapping PT ranges, which is very useful for uh, doing comparisons, complementary studies of the physics at the two places. Uh, we have, uh, as you can see at the bottom, we'll be able to do uh, XJT measurements with very good resolution. Uh, we'll be able to do fragmentation functions uh, very nicely, both in PP and P gold and compare them. And that's, again, a part of the overall plan to do jet physics, pick apart jets either longitudinally or with angular correlations. And uh, the statistics for that will be really, I think, very, very useful. For closed heavy flavor, for upsilons, uh, this, again, very you know, literally scale-dependent measurement where you're sensitive to distance scales in the QGP, in the lower left, you can see the RAA for the different members of the Upsilon family. This is then incorporating a particular model of the suppression of the different states. So in fact, in this model, the Upsilon 3S is so suppressed in gold-gold uh, uh, collisions that we would set limits on its uh, production um, if these models hold out to be true. And that's in fact, what's seen at the LHC. It's an open question whether the suppression is as strong at RIC energies and uh, medium temperatures as they are at the higher energies and temperatures at the LHC. Uh, 
And then you can map out, we have enough statistics not to just do say RAA in some integrated form, but to pick it apart as a function of PT and that's shown in the uh, lower right. Now back to the streaming readout, because there is a, an interesting point to this. So what you see are two time series. The top is just the data that would be coming out of say the TPC. It's just an unbroken time series. You have bytes that are coming out. Every time there's some channel in the TPC above some threshold, it just produces data that goes into the data stream. The little dotted red lines you see there would be trigger events coming from the calorimeters with the minimum bias trigger or any, any other kind of trigger that we want to uh, have as part of the data acquisition system. And then what you do is you bite out a slice of that time series uh, correlated with that trigger. And the natural thing to do since the drift time in the TPC is 13 microseconds is you take a 13 microsecond bite and that becomes the data you associate with that particular event. But if we zoom in on the lower left part of this and zoom it up a little bit, you don't have to take just 13 microseconds, you can take a little bit more. And if you do, you now increase the amount of data you're taking, but in PP, what that means is you now sample minimum biased events. You haven't triggered on them, but they're there. It means you get two to three orders of magnitude more minimum bias PP events in this than you would ordinarily get. It's a huge minimum bias sample, which means if you look in the upper left for open heavy flavor, RAA, the difficulty is always the denominator. How do you get enough statistics in PP? Well, normally this is done as RCP, and the data is all from gold gold or lead lead, but in our case, we'll have enough statistics in PP to do a proper RAA measurement of B mesons, prompt Ds, and so forth. And we'll be able to do uh, flow measurements uh, and also RAA for B jets, which is the, the plot shown in the lower left. And we'll be able to do lambdas. And this is kind of an lambda to D0. So this is a really interesting point because S Phoenix doesn't have pi K P PID. It doesn't have a time of flight system. However, these uh, uh, decay topologies are so complex, two or three uh, different particles, that reconstructing them using our vertexing detector and the momentum and uh, tracking abilities of the TPC gives us really good signal to background. And we can do these kinds of measurements even without this uh, usual pi KP PID. So that uh, shows in blue the addition to this kind of measurement of lambda to D as a function of PT compared to the, the results that have already been obtained by STAR, which is the, the single red data point there at about four GeV. So this is a very nice addition. Now, just to summarize here, I think I've got a couple of minutes. Um, I, I've tried to provide you some context. Uh, it's, I hope it's clear that Rick's science mission has an end and uh, the data that's coming in 22 and then in 23, 24, and 25 is going to complete that science mission. It has a very clear purpose. And to do that, there are targeted, but in the case particularly of S Phoenix, very extensive upgrades. You may not realize this, but S Phoenix is called an upgrade of the Phoenix experiment. Kind of like if you upgraded your house by bulldozing it to the ground first and then building a new house, but it's called an upgrade. And then in addition, there are uh, optimizations to the way the accelerator is going to run. So for instance, for S Phoenix, for the first time at RIC, we'll operate with a small crossing angle where the beams won't be hitting head on, but with a two milliradian crossing angle. And these are key to extracting the physics that both STAR and S Phoenix plan to do. Uh, obviously, since S Phoenix has a, uh, one of its main goals is jet physics uh, and heavy probes, uh, S Phoenix and Jetscape physics uh, aims are very, very well aligned. It's high statistics, it's highly differential, it's scale dependent, and all of this is trying to get at the, um, the physics that underlies the QGP uh, behaviors. I hope with the, some of the baby pictures I've shown you, you can get the impression, true impression, that S Phoenix construction is really now becoming S Phoenix assembly. Things are getting rigged into place. Uh, one goal and well, challenge that we have is to make sure that there are sufficient cryo weeks funded 
to really take advantage of all of this in the coming years. There's always gonna be budget pressures. Um, so we're trying to make the case as best we can. And uh, there's a, the PAC was very, very helpful in, in making it clear why that's so important. And so let me just finish on the, a final note here, which is, I hope it's clear that uh, we're all looking forward to the new data that's coming in 2022 with STAR and in 2023 and, and after with both STAR and particularly with S Phoenix. And so with that, I will uh, stop sharing and I'd be happy to take any questions, answer anything, anything at all. Very, very good timing. It's, uh, yeah. Very, very good timing. Like better, than my, uh, better, better than my iPhone. <laughs> okay, uh, so do we have any uh, questions and comments? And uh, you can nothing on the Slack channel, but um, you know, I do have one question, mm -hmm. and and that is, um, I mean, you, you've shown what a tool of force it's going to be to set up the detector and take the data. Uh, out of experience from the past. You know, a decade or two, uh, it's also clear that, you know, analyzing data is a challenge when an experiment kind of has shut down and everybody is moving on to the next big thing. So, so, so how are you going to ensure that all the data that you're going to take is, is really going to be analyzed and come out in a timely fashion? Yeah, so that, that's a, an, excellent, uh, an excellent question. So uh, a lot of that hinges on computing. Um, and so uh, what we have done is the RIC experiments have typically in the past, the focus on, is on taking the data and then sometimes it um, matures on tape for some time before it really gets analyzed. That works for fine wines, not so much for physics data. S Phoenix is really taking the LHC methodology to heart and we are saying, we are going to reconstruct the data with a short fixed uh, latency. And it's not just that it's, that sounds like a good idea so we get the results out quickly. Because S Phoenix has to run in this limited window of time and each year's running is unique. You have got to know that what you just took is correct. And so uh, the computing facility is beefing up in a major way to provide enough computing that S Phoenix can really crunch through what it needs to do with a fixed latency. The bigger picture then is of course, even if you've reconstructed the data and people are analyzing, you can worry there's a long tail to that. And you know now people are drifting off to the EIC and things like that. And that then becomes you know kind of a, a people management challenge for the collaboration. Um, but I think we'll have the, data in a form where it's really, okay, it's on tape or on disk, it's ready to go. You need to, you know, turn it into the plots, give the talks, write the papers, but we won't be waiting around for the heavy number crunching with S Phoenix as we have done uh, traditionally with the RIC experiments. Cool, thank you. I don't see any hands up, um, but maybe then I have a chance to have a, yeah. a, a comment or question. The, uh, so you do have like a PP run, right? Uh, that give you oh, enough on, for a better baseline. Y yes, yes, right. That, that's really great. Yeah. Right, so it's, it's um, that's the second year of running, that's 2024. Um, and as I tried to, to point out, we have strategies to try and really maximize the amount of data that we get in that, that year with this uh, streaming readout, really just to inhale all the data that's available. Um, the tricky thing for us, I mentioned in the summary, making sure there's enough cryo weeks to do everything. The, the absolutely indispensable thing for us is the proton-proton baseline. Yeah, yeah. It would be very, very nice to have a very good proton gold data set too, but we have to admit that's a second priority. And so if the time gets squeezed, then S Phoenix would argue to drop the proton gold running. And, and we hate to do that, but 
you know, if, if the crunch comes, we got to get the proton proton data. And so that's part of our argument. You don't want to see the proton gold data not get taken. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So in your uh, in, in, in most of your slides, you emphasize a lot on the jet, you know, reconstructed jets. And but do you have any? I assume you still be able to do particle tracking. Um, oh, sure. And in particular, what I'm interested in is essentially the correlation between the gamma and jet with uh, uh, with very soft hadrons. Yes, for example. Yes. Uh, so, right. So the, the, t the combination of the MVTX, the vertexing silicon, the inner the silicon strip out of that and the TPC with excellent, excellent uh, particle tracking, really, uh, really outstanding momentum resolution and very good tracking. So, yes, uh, in fact, people are looking at particle flow algorithms, which then are crucially dependent on yeah, yeah, yeah. bringing together the tracking and the calorimetry. And then, in addition, correlating jets with everything else in the event particle by particle that's that's right that's a big part so of my story. final comment is that whether do you guys have some kind of white paper um sure i mean we have i mean uh, is what i'm uh, maybe i mean i because right now i think you know most of jet physics uh a lot of models has been tuned to fit like LEC and, and the previous RIC data, so on. And most of the calculations really are ready. I, I think it's very important to have some kind of documentation of what is the exact coverage, you know, what's your resolution, so yeah. that uh, the theorists actually within, especially within the JSCAP, they can really crank up the machine and have all these uh, uh, theory predictions ready before you actually, um, your data coming out. Sure, and, and, and all of that information is available and you know, it's, it's straightforward enough to, to point people to it. And we've had very good inter interactions with Jetscape in the past on exactly doing that, right? You know, trying to get yeah, the right yeah. calculations and, and all of that uh, appropriate for what S Phoenix would do. That's always been uh, very, very productive. So I, yeah, I think you're exactly right. You know, last call for predictions uh, and making sure that those are really uh, nailed down before we start to take data in 23 is, it's a good opportunity for something like Jetscape to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah. I think um, um, 